governor Yinsom Wike says Nigeria is bleeding under the APC government. We'll find out exactly what it means by that statement. An aggrieved youth in the APC appeared to have shed their swords after a reconciliation effort in a bid to avert an imminent crisis that is to happen at the national convention later this month. Hello everyone and welcome. This is Politics Today live on Channels Television. I'm Shumwa Kimbalo in Abuja. Well, it is exactly a week from uh, today and that's about seven days since uh, President, uh, the National Assembly re-amended, passed and again transmitted the electoral bill to President Buhari for his assent. This comes after he has first rejected it, but he told China Television that it will sign the bill should the National Assembly fix all the gray areas. And so the nation awaits the president's assent and are hoping that it will keep to his promise of signing the bill. Well, I tell you that the governor of Riverside in some weekend says Nigeria is bleeding under the leadership of the ruling All Progressive Congress, APC, is asking members of his political party, the People's Democratic Party, to reunite themselves and close ranks in order to rescue the country from what he described as the bad leadership of the ruling All Progressive Congress, APC, in the 2023 general election. Take a listen to Governor Yin Sang Wuke, who paid a visit to the former chairman of the APC in Kaduna, Senator McCarthy. My ambition is for PDP to be united. If you have a united party, then you are sure of victory. What does it profit you that you want to be a president and you have a presidential ticket of a party and the party cannot win the election? Does it make sense? So it's even really better that you're not even a presidential candidate, but the party wins the uh, election. So for me, the unity of the party is paramount. It's not going about you want to be president, don't be president. For me, it is how the party will yeah. be and fight this evil, this monster they call the All Progressive uh, 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 Congress. Well, that's the governor of River State in some week. We might be getting some reaction to that statement uh, uh, later in the program. Well, let's check out some of your political roundup stories. The president has returned to Abuja after attending the 35th ordinary session of the Assembly of Heads of Government of the African Union in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. While at the summit, President Buhari presented Nigeria's peer review report to the 31st Africa Peer Review Forum of the African Union. The president pledged the administration's commitment to the protection of the poor and vulnerable in the country. On the sidelines of the summit, he met with the Prime Minister of Ethiopia, Abe Ahmed, where both leaders called for visionary leadership and strong institutions in Africa that caters to the needs of the people and provides disincentives to conflicts and coups. Also, during a meeting with the Prime Minister of Palestine, Mohamed Shatir, President Buhari pledged Nigeria's commitment to the pursuit of peace and progress in Africa and other parts of the world by consistently standing for justice, fairness and inclusiveness in global affairs. As political activities gather momentum towards the 2023 general elections, a former governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria and former Emir of Kano, Sanusi Lamido, has admonished Nigerians to choose wisely based on competence and trust, saying that the country is living on extra time. He was speaking in Abel Kuta, the Ogun State capital, during a reception organized in his honor by a Gbam Muslim community. While dismissing going into partisan politics, the former Emir of Kano was quick to express his desire to make himself readily available for service to humanity, just as he challenged religious leaders to speak up as a conscience of the people. We owe it to ourselves because we know that this country deserves better than we have been giving ourselves. 
The list of aspirants for the 2023 presidential election in Nigeria may be growing by the day, but the Edo State Governor, Godwin Obaseke, believes he should have more technocrats than core politicians. According to him, only professionals can stay in Nigeria at this critical point where the world is changing to a technologically driven platform. Mr. Obaseke was speaking at the government house in Benin City, the Edo State capital, where one of the presidential aspirants, Dele Momodu, paid him a courtesy visit to solicit his support. In his comments, the PDP presidential hopeful insists that not only is he qualified, he now has a solid political platform to contest unlike his attempt back in 2011, where he was a presidential flag bearer of the National Conscience Party. We have to participate to make a difference for our children and the generations to come. But this state government has reassured the people of the state that all the ongoing projects embarked upon by the present administration will be completed to serve the people and improve their standard of living. The State Commissioner for Works and Housing Engineer, Bubaka O'Hare, gave the assurance while reeling out the achievement of Governor Yaya Bello's led administration in the last six years. Politicians will not be able to rig elections in Nigeria if all eligible citizens come out to vote during elections. That's according to Yega Africa, a civil society organization, while sensitizing traders in Abuja on the need for them to get their permanent voter cards ahead of the February 12 area council elections in the federal capital territory. According to the executive director, Yega Africa, citizens cannot sit on the fence on the issue of governance, but should participate to ensure that the right leaders get to power. Bochi State Governor Bella Mohammed has promised to connect more communities with road infrastructure, especially landlocked areas of Bochi South. He assures that he has no desire to exclude any community from his developmental plans just because they failed to vote for him during the last election. Governor Mohammed was speaking to residents of Toro and Das local government areas while distributing assorted empowerment items to them under the Kaura Economic Empowerment Program. The Academic Staff Union of Universities also has appealed to the federal government to honor and implement the Memorandum of Understanding the union entered with the government that led to the suspension of the last strike action. Arising from the zonal meeting of the union held at the Federal University Lokoja, the union said that the Congress was called for the purpose of mobilizing and sensitizing its members on the pending issues that the federal government has been foot dragging to implement in the interest of academic staff of the universities. Addressing newsmen shortly after the Congress that involved ASO leadership of the seven universities from Nsuka Zone, the chairperson, Aso Federal University Lokoja, Dr. Silas Joshua, lamented that some of the issues that led to the one-year strike action by the union and was suspended in December 2020 were not yet addressed by the government. All right, and you've been served with your political roundup stars. I'll tell you also that a group within the All Progressives Congress, APC, uh, uh, they call themselves the Progressive Rebirth Movement, has withdrawn a suit filed against the leadership of the Bunin led caretaker committee. Speaking to journalists in Abuja, the leader of the group, Aliu Audu, told journalists in Abuja that their action is not to pull down the party, but to ensure that the party moves forward to deliver promises for Nigeria. Well, you know we're all young people, and uh, APC is a party of young people. And uh, any political organization, or you know, any human organization, there are bound to be, uh, you know, uh, disagreements and agreements, whatever it is. Uh, um, our brothers and sisters here uh, have had cause to show their concern over certain things over a period of time. Uh, and uh, now they are here, we have all reconciled. Uh, they have tabled out their concerns. Uh, some of them have been taken care of by the party. The party has listened because the party is a listening party anyways. And, uh, you know, we're here to just uh, hold our hands and sing Kumbaya <laughs> and say that uh, we are now one united uh, youth wing of the party. Um, and uh, we are here to proceed and make sure that we defend the cause of young people in the upcoming convention and hopefully in the general election in 2023 as well. On matters relating to the rule of law, the Nigerian Immigration Service has confirmed to a federal high court in Abuja that a seized passport of the former River State Governor, Mr. Peter Odili, has been returned to him. The service said that the passport seized, which was on the order of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, was returned to Mr. Odili on the 20th of December 2021. The late counsel to the Immigration Service, Mr. Jimo Adamu, in an affidavit of compliance to the court that the document was released to Mr. Odili based on the earlier judgment of the Federal High Court. The trial judge, Justice Inyang Airquo, 
subsequently revoked a 2 million Naira fine imposed on the council to the immigration service. And tonight, our attention is on the Buhari government agenda to fight corruption and on the issues of the rule of law. Fighting corruption is part of the three main agenda of the ruling APC when they came into power in 2015, which they said they would vigorously pursue. But almost seven years down the line, how far has those promises, especially in relation to corruption and the rule of law, been kept tonight? Our guest is the number one law officer in the land. He was the national legal advisor of the defunct Congress for Progressive Change, CPC. He was actively involved in the formation of the All Progressive Congress, APC, in 2013 as a resource person to the Manifesto Drafting Subcommittee of Interjoint Party Merger Committees between the CPC. In 2015, he was appointed as the Attorney General of the Federation tonight. We have the Minister of Justice and the Attorney General of the Federation, Mr. Abubakar Malami, Senior Advocate of Nigeria. He joins us here in our Abuja studio. Thank you so much, Honorable Minister, for joining us tonight. Thank you, Sheung. And a happy new year. This is the first time I'm seeing you this year, though. Thank you very much, Sheung. Same All with you. Same I think you. we should begin on uh, what perhaps is one major role that President Buhari hung on your neck when you assume office is to fight corruption, apart from just being, uh, being the, uh, the chief law officer of the land. Um, if you look at it, Nigeria continued a spiral fall on the uh, Corruption Perception Index for a fifth consecutive time, making Nigeria a second most corrupt country in West Africa after Guinea. In spite of all of these administration says it is doing in fighting corruption. Now, let me get your reaction to the Transparency International report? Well, I think um, the major considerations that should constitute the basis for assessment of the successes of the Nigerian government as far as the fight against corruption should not be an exclusive position of the Transparency International. Other institutions of refute that obtains in the system include United Nations, UNODC, Office of, United Nations Office of uh, Drugs and Crimes, among others, and the empirical evidence that is visibly seen as it relates to the efforts of Buhari's government in the fight against corruption. So now, coming to the international institutes or associations or um, uh, associations of refute. The assessment of United Nations Office of Drugs and Corruption, the latest uh, assessment, which was uh, a 2019 assessment of Nigeria as a nation, was the fact that among the 17 items of assessment, Nigeria has indeed done wonderfully well, and I'm talking of wonderfully well as the operative word, in terms of the fight against corruption as it relates to the 17 items. So when you now juxtapose the position of United Office, Office of Drugs and Crimes against the position of Transparency International in terms of refutation, that places a fundamental question mark on the Transparency International assessment. Now, if you are talking of the international perhaps commendations associated with it further. The position of the United Nations Office of, uh, I mean of, uh, on Drugs and Crimes has been further consolidated by the fact that the African Union has indeed recognized President Muhammadu Buhari as the champion of anti-corruption. And then if you are talking of the empirical, physical evidence on the ground as far as the Nigerian state is concerned, in terms of the institutional performance as it relates to the corruption and the fight against corruption. Here we are as a government that now inherited in prosecution and conviction sense about 130 convictions as at 2014, 2015 when we came in as a government by the EFCC. I'm now talking of the institutions. And then today, as at the end of 2021, now within a year, Nigeria has recorded over 2,000 convictions by EFCC. So if you are talking 
of the year in, year out empirical evidence as it relates to the performance of our institutions, one single institution, I'm talking of EFCC for that matter, it establishes a point that Transparency International Corruption Index, again, the background of the international position as it relates to UNODC report, again, the background of the commendation by the African Union as it relates to the commendation of President Mamuhari, and empirical evidence as it relates to the performance of EFCC, it goes without saying that the, there is no basis upon which the Transparency International Report can stand. All right. And, and let me ask you, Honorable Minister, Transparency International, as an organization, how would you rate it? Uh, from a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the highest, how would you rate that organization? Well, um, um, if you are talking of the international refutation, perhaps, I think um, juxtaposing the position of Transparency International against the position of UNODC, I think I leave you to answer the question. But the truth of the matter is, when you are talking of the United Nations, everybody knows with that question, where the refutation, where the basis, the uh, empirical basis for assessment stand. So if you are talking of Transparency International and then United Nations, your office on, I mean, of drugs and crimes, where does the answer in terms of reputation, in terms of standing, in terms of universality of position stand? My answer is United Nations institutions are refuted to be the best institutions for international assessment of so, issues. So this government does not rate in any way uh, Transparency International? The universal, the universal position of government, the universal position of United Nations Office speaks for the government. So as far as we are concerned, when you are talking of Transparency International and then you are now talking of United Nations Office of, I mean, on Drugs and Crimes, then the answer, as far as we are concerned, is uh, in a rating sense, the same way the Transparency International is rating institutions, if you rate the position of Transparency International as against that of United Nations Office, my answer is United Nations Office on Drugs and Crimes stands clear. And then if you are talking of the assessment as far as the West Africa, or perhaps the African states are concerned, the fact that the government of President Muhammad Buhari has been commended, and indeed his person has now been rated as the champion of anti-corruption, now establishes a point that there is no basis, no foundation, no justiciable ground, and indeed no standing upon which the transparency report can stand. So specifically for the uh, benefit of our viewers who are watching it tonight, so that they can get you clearly, this government does not in any way reckon with Transparency International and its report. International recon has been established by United Nations Office of Drugs and Crimes. Because the reason why I'm asking, Nigeria is not the only country that is being assessed here. Almost 200 countries around the world have been uh, assessed. Nigeria, uh, before you, uh, your government came into power, have been assessed. And but now the report is saying Nigeria has dropped for the fifth consecutive time. The question is, Honorable Minister, when you attend international community, this Transparency International report keeps denting the image of the country. And when you say that you don't reckon with it based on your own uh, assessment of it, it still keeps denting the image of the country. What do you do about that? Well, the image of the country, as far as I'm concerned, within the context of Committee of Nations, within the context of international assessment or by institutions of refute, is the fact that the United Nations Office of Drugs and Crimes has established a point. And then if you are talking of assessment within the context of African nations, this is a transparency international assessment that is saying Nigeria is coming down the ladder in terms of successes associated with it. But the African nations this time around coming together to now, uh, to now comment the government of President Muhammad Buhari in terms of the fact against corruption, it establishes a point that at the point of international universality of assessment, we have indeed been acknowledged as doing wonderfully well by the United Nations Office of, I mean, on Crimes and Drugs. And then within the context of the, uh, of the regional perception, here is a government 
that has not been commended. Here is the president that has not been commended in terms of it. And within the empirical consideration of it, this is a government that now came to power at a time when convictions record of an institution, one of the institutions, anti-corruption institution for that matter, has a record of 130 in a year. And then the government now has recorded over 2,000 convictions within a year. Because so it does not support... Honorable Minister, if you look at it, I mean, we should look at it from some other uh, prism. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you react then to some people who have said, look, in fact, um, corruption under this government is even far reaching. Uh, and when you ask for evidence, the people say, oh, uh, it's just motion, uh, a lot of motion without uh, specific and actual movement. Well, uh, the movement, as far as the fight against corruption, is established by convictions. I, on, I, I think you can rightly believe or agree with me in that perception. So if you have a record of uh, 103 at a point in 2014, 2015, and then you now have a record of over 2,000 in 2021, it goes without saying that the motion you are looking for in terms of the fight against corruption is there. So uh, uh, the, the logical conclusion arising therefrom is this government is doing wonderfully well in terms of attack, enforcement, prevention of corruption within the index of um, empirical available evidence that can visibly be seen. The empirical evidence is, the, uh, is to the effect that we have recorded no convictions investigations are ongoing and then there are no restrictions or limit to uh, the consideration in terms of investigation and prosecution of high-profile cases. Let, let me ask and you much, about uh, these high much more cases. In yeah. terms of speed as far as uh, uh, the uh, conclusion and determination of cases are concerned. Let me ask you, I mean, you mentioned high-profile cases, mm. but there are worries about um, the state of some of these, the status of some of these high-profile cases. Because for some people, would say, look, it's just a matter of uh, uh, there seems to be some delay mechanism. Just maybe people can forget about some of these high-profile cases. Can you give us status report on some of these high-profile cases and perhaps the reason why they are being delayed? Well, in terms of delay, I think you can agree with me very well. And rightly so for that matter, that as far as this government is concerned, the idea of delay in prosecution of cases and their determination does not arise. Why? Why? Because if you are looking at it from the perspectives of legislative framework, this is the government that is administering and indeed enforcing the provisions of our Administration of Criminal Justice Act, which allows for day in, day out prosecution of cases. And over and above that, in terms of volume and number of convictions recorded relating to high profile cases, I would like to mention names, but you know very well those that are indeed convicted within the lifespan and context of this um, administration as it relates to high profile convictions recorded. You know very well those that are standing trials within the context and lifespan of this government in terms of high profile cases. So I did over and above the investigations prosecutions and indeed the convictions of the 2,000 cases recorded, I mean convictions recorded by EFCC in 2021, a lot of them are higher profile cases. So what are you talking about in terms of delay? Again, the background of the fact that over 2,000 convictions are recorded mm -hmm. within a year. They are politically exposed cases. They are high profile cases. Let me uh, draw out a few of them so that maybe you can respond, uh, respond to them specifically. Yes. The, the case of the former secretary to the government of the Federation, Mr. Babachi Lawa, mm -hmm. what is the status of that case? Is it presented before the court or is not? It that is, is presented but because before so the court. So when a matter is subjected and presented before the court for determination, whose responsibility is it in terms of speed and determination? My answer is a matter has been investigated, a matter has been presented before a court of law for prosecution, and the speed, and uh, the speed associated with it against the background of the existing law, Administration of Criminal Justice Act, that allows for day in, day out, you cannot, by any stretch of imagination, place a blame associated with the conclusion and determination of that case on the doorstep of the executive. So you it blame is, the judiciary it for it? It is exclusively a judicial affair. Are you trying to and resolve within, some of these delays? 
We are. Because it's part of uh, what Nigeria, you have promised in yes. your, your own time, yes. that you will work on ensuring judicial reforms in our judicial system. Yes, and we have brought in a lot of reforms within the context of speedy determination of cases among those that are brought to bear with that has indeed contributed to the successes we have recorded in terms of volume and number in the application, enforcement and operation of criminal administration of criminal justice act among others. So we have taken steps in legislative sense by providing a legislative framework. We have taken steps in due diligence in the prosecution of cases which has eventually resulted to multiple convictions within a span of a year. So against the background of the fact that we have provided the legislative framework, we have taken uh, steps in due deal and diligent prosecution of cases, and we have indeed recorded successes in terms of multiplication of volume of convictions within mm. a period of time. It is a clear pointer that we have indeed promised and eventually succeeded in delivery. What about the case of Hush Puppy? Any, any update on that? Well, um, as you rightly know, it is an issue that has both national and international dimensions. And uh, in respect of the two uh, actions I've been taking, it's a work in progress locally and internationally. And we are doing whatever it takes to ensure justice is done within the context of the law, regardless of the personalities involved. In the, case, in the work that the FBI is doing, the prosecution, on the, is it helping the Nigerian case? We are hearing and seeing a result on the side of the Americans. So why are we not seeing much on the side of, uh, on, on our side here? You see, uh, issues that has to do with criminality and the enforcement of uh, laws associated with crimes and offenses uh, uh, may have local international coloration. But then in the case of Hush Puppy, as you rightly know, multiple jurisdictions are involved. The UAE, uh, United Arab Emirates, America and indeed Nigeria. So within the context of the International Committee of Nations as it relates to the prosecution of cases, the international community is indeed collaborating and providing the necessary supports for the purpose of ensuring that uh, justice is done to the case with the, uh, I mean, with the peculiarities of the matter taken into consideration. So what I'm saying in essence that internationally and locally, all hands are on deck. What about the Nigerian side of things? America is doing its own. We see that prosecution is going on in America. But, as but in Nigeria, there are other allied uh, matters, re facts related to the issue in America. Nigeria, but what is being Nigeria, done on Nigerian when, soil? When criminality is involved, Nigeria and U.S., for example, naturally works together when the, uh, there are elements of the offenses that have, uh, I mean, that has taken place uh, in the diverse jurisdictions. So Nigeria is indeed doing the needful by way of supporting what the America is doing for the purpose of ensuring that uh, uh, the cases are tried accordingly within the context of the American aspect of it. And then eventually, if there is need for local prosecution, nothing as well stops it. So what I'm saying, in essence, it is about the international collaboration. And then we are seeing the result of the international collaboration in ensuring that those that are alleged to have, in one way or the other, been, uh, I, I mean, uh, in one way or the other, in abuse, operating in abuse of the position of the law, are now brought to justice. The so there's nothing concrete on Osh no, from now? From, no, there from, are a lot of from, things concrete in terms of joint investigation and in terms of considering Where are the we outcome. exactly on that? Well, uh, you see, uh, as far as investigation is concerned, why we are now, it is about collaboration. And then we are collaborating both. So there is no the prosecution AD. happening here in Nigeria Not yet. Not immediately yet. What about how about Kiari, the police officer? That is linked to that matter. Well, generally we speaking, that? well, generally speaking, as I have stated earlier, it is about international collaboration. We are collaborating, we are working, and then it is work in progress. But the Abakari matter is not about collaboration. It's about it, the investigation that was instituted it is about on Nigeria within the police and also yeah, will link to your office. But, but, but there are components of it. It is of international dimension. One thing I can tell you so about what's the, the outcome cases. of the investigation from Nigerian side? Well, there are a lot of uh, issues that are ongoing, inclusive of the possibility of consideration for extradition associated things. That is where the collaboration element of it comes into play in respect of all the two cases. So there's a possibility of extradition? 
there could be a, a need or perhaps the possibility of making such requests and uh, looking well, into it. Was there a request for extradition? Well, as far as I'm concerned, the parties are discussing, the parties are collaborating, and then there are exchange of correspondence from the perspectives of investigation, from the perspectives of extradition and associated things. Is so, a police officer found guilty from the investigation? Has you can't find culpable? someone guilty. You can't find someone guilty, but perhaps the reasonable ground for suspicion can be established. Will translate to prosecution that will eventually translate. Because the, to, the panel has a quasi-judicial role. And function. No, no. So they no. could also, of course, find some kind of culpability uh, they, they, in their investigation. Prima facie, that is what we are talking of um, uh, reasonable grounds for suspicion. Reasonable grounds for suspicion has been established, and that will eventually translate to the possibility of prosecution and eventual conviction, if indeed, at the end of the day, the one is a judge guilty by a court of law. So what is the position now? Extradition the, the, or the, prosecution? The position now is there are prima facie grounds, reasonable grounds for suspicion that have been considered from the perspectives of prosecution, from the perspective of likely extradition if the need for so doing arises. That is what uh, is unfolding in terms of international collaboration. All right, Honorable Minister, we take a breather, Thank get you. a cup of water. Then when we come back, there's still so much more to talk about on the issue of the rule of law and a fight against corruption under the APC government. We have the number one law officer in the land, and we're talking about what this government is doing to fight corruption as it promises and its perception on the rule of law. Stay with us, everyone. Our conversation with the Honorable Attorney General of the Federation and the Minister of Justice, Abaka Malami, continues right after now. Welcome back, everyone. Our conversation tonight is with the Honorable Attorney General of the Federation and the Minister of Justice, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Abubakar Malami. Thank you so much, Honorable Minister, for your time tonight. Thank you, Shil. We're just talking about some high-profile cases. Uh, one, another case in point is the case of the former EFCC Chairman, Mr. Ibrahim Mago. It just looked like the investigation happened, uh, everything just went under, and nothing has been heard. What is the latest? As he returned to the police force, what can you tell us? What's the status report on that? It's a work in progress, Sheun. So what does, what does work in progress mean? Well, um, you know, naturally, when you are talking of a government, and uh, particularly when issues are complex in terms of multiplicity, you may have a component that could be administrative. You may have a component that could have some criminal undertones in terms of perhaps maybe reasonable grounds for suspicion. And you may have components that could require additional investigation for the purpose of taking position. So these complexities naturally are not issues that you can take clear cut position overnight. You allow institutions because multiple institutions are involved. If you are a public officer, for example, and then you uh, there is an allegation against you of living above uh, your means the code of conduct may have a role to play. If criminality is involved in terms of an allegations of commission of a crime, certain criminal investigations, either by the police or indeed the EFCC, ICPC, could come into play. If you are talking about administrative issues, as it relates to a police officer, perhaps the public, um, the police service commission may equally have a role to play. So with this kind of complexities associated with an issue of investigation, you must have to allow the agencies of government responsible for each and every item under consideration to now take necessary steps. But, but, but Minister, that's we thought that has, been, uh, has happened. How long does it take to, to deal with the case of one person? Uh, the report, we understand the presidency had gotten the report the man has been replaced at the EFCC. Is he back in the service now? Do you know whether he's back in the service? Or what is his status right now? Well, I think at a point what happened, he was placed on suspension and Mr. President has taken a decision to allow someone to act. So um, with that in mind, 
you understand, and uh, the report having been received, it is only logical to consider allowing the other agencies of government that have one role or the other to play to do what they are supposed to do in terms of conclusion of the report for the purpose of arriving at a decisive position. And I think that is uh, what, uh, the, I mean, uh, how much I can say as far because as Because the reason why I'm asking going. this question is that there are a lot of inference that have been drawn into it, like a political uh, political undertone, persecution, a lot of things have been drawn. Mm -hmm. And so it would be good to know that um, uh, a tone of finality has been drawn into this matter. That's why Nigerians will want to know tonight where that case has landed, or is it buried forever, or is it been concluded? Is there a note of finality? That's what Nigerians Well, like when you know. talk of the government of President Muhammad Buhari, the, it's a government that has no reputational issues, issues of reputation as far as uh, political persecution is concerned. So um, the idea of perhaps an insinuation of political persecution does not arise, taking into consideration the fact that it is a government that is built on integrity, it is a government that is built on due process and uh, allowing things to take their natural course devoid of impunity. So the idea of a political persecution does not in the circumstances arise, but certainly out of caution to ensure due process, to ensure things are done within the context of the law and due process. So you mean no, that is, the, the, the investigation or prosecution, we've, you've gone past investigation, is prosecution on the case of Magu? So what I'm saying in essence is um, uh, you allow the institutions that I have mentioned among others to do the needful in terms of arriving at finality before a final decision is right. taken and that is what makes it work in progress and uh, they are indeed doing the needful as far as their respective um, uh, statutory duties All right. are concerned. I have a long list of questions which um, I like to take you up on, so I like to take them quickly. Yes. Um, the issue of the Ikoyi money, those dollars that were found in Ikoyi, mm. where are they? What, what is the end point of those monies? Well, um, honestly, I have to refer back to records to refresh my memory, but one thing I think you need to know is uh, the fact that the issue was an issue that was indeed handled by uh, an agency of the government. So I have not been, uh, as of today, I wasn't as, uh, expecting this question, so I have not taken my time to uh, seek for clarifications for the purpose of briefing. So I'm not in a position to say clearly, but one thing that I want to state categorically and clearly, that any monies that are indeed forfeited to the federal government, final forfeiture, are indeed supposed to be part of uh, the monies meant to service budget. So I'm not in a position to clearly say with mm. precision well, as to whether the, such final for future. You know why we, we need to know some of the, mm. I mean, the, because the, fine, these monies are Nigerian monies, yes. right? One, two, Nigerians want to get uh, closure into some of these issues because there are a lot of issues. Do you promise that you're going to get back as a matter of statement from your office so that we can know on that for those who are watching now so that since well, you don't have the fact that we might be able to get a letter from your office. Well, I, uh, I assure you that um, again, the background of the uh, question presented and perhaps the desire of the Nigerian, uh, Nigerians to know what the position is, I will certainly uh, reserve that point for the letter day in terms of giving a comprehensive and precise position. Right. But one thing I think that, is, uh, that needs to be stated categorically, that in our budget of 2021, 20, uh, sorry, 2020, 2021, and 2022, we have a component of uh, budget servicing that relates to the recovered assets. And if indeed there has been a final forfeiture order relating to that money, it means by implication that money, that money must have been applied to the servicing of the budget. But as I stated, I will certainly get clarifications right. under for the, I mean, perhaps maybe during our next interview. Two we, quick ones, Minister. Yes. One is on the issue of the Abacha loot. What is the status update on that? Well, the status of it, um, as you know very well, uh, two major recoveries were made, or perhaps three. One, it was a recovery made in, uh, I mean, from Switzerland in, uh, uh, in 20, uh, 2017, which monies were applied in social investment programs, which constituted a budget item in that year. As it, uh, and that was uh, the money that was applied in the end power 
and the uh, uh, market women trader money and the associated public works support mm -hmm. programs and uh, that money was effectively utilized for that purpose and then another one that was the money re uh, recovered in 2020 which was uh, recovered from us island of jersey and indeed uh, uk which was around 311 which was applied in the three major projects by the understanding among the um, participating nations which uh, projects were uh, abuja kano uh, lagos ibadan and uh, uh, second niger bridge and uh, as you rightly know these projects are indeed uh, been executed with greater speed to the extent that even the second Niger Bridge is, uh, has indeed reached an advanced stage. So those monies were recovered, those monies were applied. And then additional money that was indeed recovered was uh, over $70 million from, uh, arising from Malabu, which was equally an offshoot of the Abachalut, which was equally applied to this project. So what I'm trying to say, in essence, there were recoveries made. And then the monies were, by the parties' agreement, agreed to be applied to specific projects, and those money right. were fact of the budget, and then were indeed expended accordingly. So we're expecting a large tranche, I mean, uh, uh, another tranche now? Yes, we are working when is on that, is that due? Well, uh, you see, in terms of international recoveries, you cannot be certain in, ter I mean, in time sense. Mm -hmm. But then we have reached advanced stage, and then mutual um, draft agreements have been exchanged and considered. Right. So we are looking at the possibility of um, having such money, additional money recovered in shortest possible time. Quickly too, a former governor of Imo State, Rocha Asokurocha, went to the president last week and reported the EFCC. He alleged political witch hunt against him on a matter he said was a settled case. Um, you oversight over the EFCC. What's your reaction on that matter? Well, you cannot stop uh, anyone from making any allegation, either wild or indeed uh, reasonable or out of context. But um, one thing I can tell you clearly that um, it is not part of the agenda of this government to which hunt. But then if there are grievances, there are allegations, they are naturally often for consideration investigation and looking into so what i am saying i am not i cannot with precision now conclude by way of adjudging the allegation of his excellency roaches as to whether it is indeed which hunting political or otherwise but one thing that i can clearly say if there is an allegation we have established a tradition of looking into it and then taking and doing the needful in terms of ensuring justice fairness and equity and equity of it is now considered a flight and uh, position taken. Does that also mean that uh, your party will not spare even its own members Ooh. and will not shield any, anybody, even if it's a member of the APC, no matter how highly placed they may be? I think most of the people now being investigated, being presented and be for the court include substantially accessible members of the APC. So that establishes a point that this is a government that takes steps regardless of who is involved in terms of ensuring that uh, no, neither impunity, no corruption or associated uh, uh, underhand dealings are tolerated. Mm. Quickly, um, we see in the realm of uh, anti-corruption and uh, the issue of Bureau de Chon operators behind terror financing. The last time you said um, you, you're going to give specific names, but as a Today, there is nothing. Is it the style of this government, or what is the reason behind not giving specifics? Well, I, I do not agree with your conclusion or insinuation that there is nothing. It has, as I've stated earlier, uh, it has always been a work in progress. And in terms of investigation, both local and otherwise, you know very well that it's not something that you can be categorical in time sense as to the time of conclusion. But one thing, reasonable grounds are pressed. Prima facie case seems to be established. Proof of evidence will have to be developed, and then eventually prosecution will take place. Mm. So there is nothing that is hidden. As far as prosecution is concerned, it is traditionally a public prosecution. And again, the background of the fact that 
prosecutions, as far as the Nigeria is concerned, are carried out in public. Nothing will be hidden both in terms of names, associated facts, and circumstances. When will this be? When will, if you say they is not, they're not hidden, it's yeah. been a while now. Yeah. Well, this is probably the third time, yeah. Minister, yes. that you and I are having this conversation. And it, you said it can be to, hidden. Because, because Nigerians are agitated. They yeah. want to know name names. Yeah. Let us shame these people. You, you see, in terms of prosecution, uh, the truth of the matter is we have established a tradition of uh, taking even the Boko Haram before the court of law and they were prosecuted and convicted. So at the point of arraignment before the court, there has to be a party charged. And then with that, the idea of perhaps maybe having someone, I mean, hiding the identity of someone does not arise. But you cannot stop work being in progress and you cannot, in the circumstances of investigation and prosecution, be preemptive of but, the situation. But, but Minister, Again, the background of the fruit. You know the insinuation drawn to this. That is yes. the reason why you're not coming up with names is mm -hmm. because your investigation is not watertight. That if you have your investigation and your evidence are watertight, you will be able to come up with names of, investigation. of the people behind. These are people who are financing the killings of Nigerians, innocent people who are killed in their, in their homes, mm -hmm. who are taken out of, uh, out of their communities and yes. deserted, yes. Uh, they, uh, I, mean, I mean, ransacked their communities. And you think that we don't need to know their names? You need to know, you will know. That is the true position of things, and uh, processes have been uh, consummated in line with the dictates of the law and necessary orders where the need for so doing of taking people to custody for the purpose of concluding the investigation have been obtained judicially. Nobody has been taken to custody arbitrarily and then a work is in progress and I assure you when are we likely soon, to get an you will be that? happy with what we are doing as a government once in a couple of uh, weeks perhaps uh, these people are charged and are in before Maybe the court. Because the, before the end of this month? So, uh, well, certainly in a number of um, weeks, you will have something tangible and cogent from... Uh, what will we expect in order, Minister? I trust that you will do it. Uh, thank if you, you say so, if you say that, it will happen in order. When I gave you my commitment in terms of um, prescription of the bandits uh, within a matter of hours, Eventually, the uh, uh, order was obtained and then gazetted accordingly. So I am I, a man of honor, I'm not out of right, but then when I make promises, I keep to them. Okay, we expect that. Uh, Honorable Minister, l let's look at the issue of uh, the likes of uh, Inam Kano and Sunday Igbo. Mm. For Sunday Igbo's matter, what is the latest on that? Well, it is a matter being prosecuted at the, um, um, I mean, at a foreign country, and uh, within the context of uh, that prosecution, uh, one thing that is apparent and uh, visible is he has been taken to custody, and uh, taken to custody on account of breaching laws applicable in a foreign nation, and with that in mind, uh, he is being prosecuted. So there is yeah. no effort in bringing him back home? Well, um, we will allow the law of a nation that was uh, indeed uh, breached to take its natural course and then perhaps maybe thereafter bringing him back home after the conclusion of the trial I have, uh, over there for the purpose of facing the Nigeria law that was accordingly breached. So uh, the position of things is we are not interfering in aborting the existing prosecution at the foreign land, uh, taking into consideration that the laws that were alleged to have been breached were indeed the laws of the foreign nation. So there's no possibility of a political solution into the matter? Well, uh, in terms of political solution, taking into consideration his standing trial in a foreign land, what so political solution can we bring to bear in terms because of... Because the agitation is there. It may be standing trial, but the agitation... Like, the same thing goes for Inlam de Kano. Well, not Any a, possibility of political resolution or uh, uh, intervention? Uh, not in terms of what he is standing trial for at the foreign nation. So perhaps maybe those considerations may be considered or perhaps may be brought to bear when he is eventually brought back after the conclusion of the trial at the foreign what nation. What about Inlam de Kano? Any poss is there still a possibility? You see, in terms of um, political prosecution, you cannot rule out any possibility. In terms of um, uh, in terms of prosecution, uh, the laws of the land naturally takes their natural course. And in our laws, there are a lot of possibilities. Uh, but what, one thing I can tell you, as it is now, the law is taking its natural course.
All right. Let me take you to one thing that a lot of Nigerians will be expecting you because the president has said that you advised him and that he's going to he's listen to you. Uh, the last time also, you did say that you've given your advice to the president on the issue of the Electoral Act Amendment Bill. The president rejected it perhaps based on your advisory and the chief of, of, of uh, law officer of the land. Mm -hmm. But f are you satisfied with what the National Assembly has done and transmitted to the president? Well, uh, in terms of satisfaction, honestly, it is premature for me to conclude. Taking into consideration, I can admit to you that um, the electoral bill was only received in my office this afternoon as I was preparing to come over for this um, engagement with uh, Channels TV. So I have not taken steps to review the content and context of what has been presented for consideration of the president. So it is premature and preemptive for me at this moment now to arrive at any conclusion, taking into consideration that I have not gone through the documents to understand what it contains and then analyze them in accordance with the constitution, in accordance with the prevailing laws. Well, taking I mean, in, yes. For someone who has in, in, been involved in political party activities, mm -hmm. I seem to want to assume that you love democracy and you want the advancement of same. And I have and worked in advancement of democracy, that democratic system. Are you optimistic about helping the president to pass what he says he wants to leave as legacy of good elections for Nigeria? If Nigerians are saying that they want the Electoral Act Amendment, are you optimistic that this bill might get passed by the president? Well, honestly, without going through, reading through, I am not in a position to assess whether the bill indeed has factored the national and public interest as against selfish interest, among others, whether it is a bill that can pass the test of constitutionality and legality. If you are not satisfied, you advise the president against it? Certainly, if I'm not satisfied and if I am of the opinion that it is against the public interest, the national interest, and then against the dictates of democratic process, I will advise accordingly. But then one thing I can tell you that we are all interested in leaving behind a legacy of um, a lasting democracy, democracy that indeed accommodate the collective interests of the Nigerian state and eventually advance the national interest, national development, and defend the democratic process. So with these considerations associated with defending democracy, with the considerations associated with the national and public interest, we will certainly do whatever it takes to move democracy to the next level. Nigerians are watching and they are holding you to account some of the things that okay. you're saying, Minister, but I want you to give Nigerians commitment. Look, there's a lot of effort, money that has been spent into these amendments. Can you tell Nigerians, we look straight into the camera and mm -hmm. say, look, Nigerians, mm -hmm. I'm committed and I will advise the president, even if it's not on this note, because, I mean, uh, it's a history to it that the president refused the last time. Mm -hmm. And there are fears that if, the, if you advise the president otherwise, it might go in the same manner. But are you given the commitment tonight she will let us that there will be op there's an optimism let about us, the passage? Yes, let us refer to the position of the president as it relates to the previous bill that was passed. What is your assessment as to, uh, the, uh, as to the reasonability or otherwise of the issues raised by the president with particular regard to the democrat uh, democratic process? As a person. No, but if you say that, why well, you if, of the if, opinion if they are that fixed, the opinion of the president, uh, the, the, the the position expressed by the president was justified or it wasn't? Oh, I mean, it's not up to me. I'm just a journalist. So yeah, as a journalist, I, I, you are yeah, a Nigerian, so, and that is deeply interested well, in role, the working of the democratic process. My role does not permit process. me to be able to make so, such judgments. But you know, the the reason why I'm asking you is 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 a matter that has getting gotten a lot of Nigerians agitated, and I wanted you to give the commitment to Nigerians that you will do your best my office, in ensuring a good passage of that bill. My office, Shewo, is a constitutional office and fundamentally governed by the public interest. And when we talk of the public interest, I'm talking of the interest of 200 Nigerians. I will be guided at all times with my odds of office associated with the public right. interest and not exclusive of perhaps the sentiment of the few. Minister, we need to go. Thank you. But there's something hanging over your party and perhaps on the neck of this government.
and it's the issue of restructuring. Let's come in, I said he wants to define his own way what restructuring means. And you've come out as a political party to say true federalism. The president has said it's true federalism is a way to go. Yeah. This government is winding down. It's a few months before you leave office. Would you say that you have properly restructured this country? Well, in terms of restructuring, I think uh, this government has provided sufficient support in defining the restructuring arrangement. Now, when you look at it from the point of restructuring associated with allowing and defining the functions of the organs of government, for example. We are living witnesses to the fact that constitutional amendment with particular regard to section 121, so section 3 of the constitution was effected. And by that amendment, the autonomy of the state legislature, the autonomy of the local government uh, system were defined and established. So I think if there are things, uh, if there is a government that has indeed supported the restructuring arrangement, within the context of functionality of the organs of government. This government is one of those governments that have indeed supported. So you have done your best in restructuring this and, country? And we will continue to do our best. What about the true federalism report from the Aero Fire Committee? Has that been jettisoned? What is the context of such true federalism you are talking about? In what way, in what No, direction? they submitted a report. The party yes, considered and, and they submitted a report. and suggested a true federalism. To what extent? Because I, you have to be specific as to the direction before I can give you a clear answer as to the federalism aspect of it. You but are in summary, this government has done its best on restructuring. I will Nigeria. keep doing its best. And that is about allowing the functionality of the organs of government, both at the federal and the state level. In terms of autonomy of the local government, autonomy yeah. of the state legislature, autonomy of judiciary, they are, I think the government has uh, tried as much as possible to ensure at the end of the day that the pillars, the foundation, and the context of federalism, which is allowing the organs of government to, uh, to operate optimally. I think the government right. is indeed supporting that, both through legislative processes and through enforcement, among others. Honorable Minister for Justice and the Attorney General of the Federation, Abubakar Malami, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, thank you so much indeed for your time again tonight. Thank you, Sharon. And good. hopefully when we get updates on some other things, we will open, open to see you back to give us more. Thank, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Sharon. Well, that's our show for tonight, everyone. Many thanks, everyone, for watching. I'm Sean Akimale. See you tomorrow.